Good morning, everybody, once again. It's definitely a pleasure to stand here in front of everybody on this uh, Community Wildfire Preparedness Day. We haven't had it for a few years. Uh, this is definitely a checks the box for your community meeting requirement for your firewise accreditation for your HOA. So if you're a lead or you're a part of that or you just heard that and you're like, what the heck is firewise? I will be happy to tell you about that offline. Um, it does help um, with the NFPA's recognition that you're going above and beyond in your particular community. And uh, sometimes that even helps and assists with uh, home insurance, which I know everybody in here is, that's, that's a top concern. So uh, once again, good morning to everybody. I think uh, even though we haven't had this for a couple of years, I want to tell you that I've been a part of a few of them, and um, our coordinators have put this together, Marcy and Laura, you guys have put together an exceptional program for us, and if we could just start off by giving the two of them a round of applause. Can we stand up? So the only problem with that is that uh, I told them I don't know what it's going to do next year, and, and I think I heard somebody say, we're not doing it next year. I mean, it was that right? So thank you guys for making this one super special and uh, kicking us back off and bringing everybody back in. So just a little bit about our program today is we're going to try to do um, some pretty you know, high intensity, low duration uh, presenters today. We're going to run that from right now until about 11.30 or so. It could go all the way to 10, but we want to get people up here, show you a little something. Every year it's a little bit different, right? We can't have every single facet of what makes us a, uh, a wildfire community um, adapt place um, with everybody. So we got to pick and choose, and that's kind of hard. But the good thing is, is that there's a lot of vendors and agencies rep in the back room, including uh, Chief Fullerton, who's dressed in civilian clothes back there for the Fire Safety Council. He's a fantastic partner and a great peer. Uh, please stop by and see him. Um, we get to share the corridor up here at Highway 4. We got Calaveras OES. They're in charge of that. Calendars alert piece with Zone Haven. Thanks for the prompt, Laura. And uh, they've got the evacuation tags, and we we've, we've just got agency after agency rep, and so so many uh, really cool things for you guys to go and network outside of this. So if you have something, you're like, well, why don't you talk about the evacuations for? It's because the evacuation pro is back there to talk to you after this, right? Um, and so on and so forth. We're gonna make a few opportunities to ask some questions, but this is going to be speedy so we can get to the hamburgers and hot dogs and networking directly with everybody afterwards, right? And so uh, if we cut you off, it's not to be disrespectful, but we're definitely gonna move the program through and then we'll pick that up uh, on a sidebar. So um, let's go ahead and also mention that uh, Marcy put together a fabulous raffle so if you haven't signed up for the raffle, it's back there, um, and you gotta get your ticket in there. There's some really, really neat prizes, um, including a chainsaw, a rake, some a millworks that brought in some slabs of wood. I mean, just ultra cool stuff. So I just want to, um, before I forget, let's get to a couple of special things. One of them for Calaveras County Public Access TV for filming this. Um, this will be, you know, reproduce for everybody to see in a, one format or another for the folks that couldn't make it here. YouTube. Oh, and YouTube. Thank you. And uh, a huge uh, call out to Nate's Tree Service. Um, they put the banner over Highway 4 and uh, for free. So thanks, Nate. Nate's, hopefully you're here to hear that. Um, and all of our sponsors. I mean, we just have so many. Uh, there's a very long list. As a matter of fact, they're behind me on the wall, I think. Oh yeah, they're still there. Okay. And the businesses who donated door prizes, we've got Millworks, Bear Valley Bicycles, Henderhaus, uh, Nate's Tree Service, Ace Hardware, and the rest of the house. So, round of applause for everyone. All right, so I managed to say we're gonna make this speedy like five times and all I've done is just stand up here. Yeah. Um, 
But anyway, I wanted to kick this off right, and I want to kick it off with our uh, District 3 Supervisor, Mark Hubbardy. Uh, thanks for being with us this morning, sir, and uh, we're going to get you rolling. Right over here. Thank you. I, uh, I've written my thoughts down just so that I can be speaking. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank you, Chief Mike Johnson, for all the time and support you spent getting me up to speed. Thank you especially for organizing this important event today for all of us. Thank you to everyone in the community, especially Marcy Powers and Laura Bauman, who helped to round up all these great speakers who are on the front lines to help us create a fire resilient community in our very vulnerable wildland urban interface. Not to mention all the vendors and businesses who have generously donated door prizes in their time. I'm really proud of the huge turnout today and all that you're helping to do to protect our homes and community. We got through a very tough winter well, almost. <laughs> Still hold on. The fire season will be here, quickly enough. We were lucky last year. This year, it could be different. We are so lucky to live surrounded by a national forest, a state park, and thousands of acres of private land owned by Sierra Pacific Industries and our own forests around our homes. But there's a good reason Cal Fire put all the communities in our district, from Murphy's to Arnold and up to Camp Connell, on this list of communities most vulnerable. It's imperative we pull out all the stops to prevent Greater Arnold and Murphy's from becoming a catastrophic, a catastrophic statistic. I've seen a lot of our constituents working to create a defensible space around their homes. If you still have brush to clear, I encourage you to take advantage of the free door-to-door -door chipper program administered by Calaveras Foothills Fire Safe Council. I have, in fact, the chipper comes to me on Monday morning, and I'll be helping to chip and clearing that I have done. All you have to do is drag the brush and tree limbs to the side of the road and a contractor will come by to chip them and leave the chips behind for you to use. You can get applications at the Fire Safety Council table there in the back. We've all read about the devastating fires of the past three years. They destroyed, they destroyed so many lives and livelihoods in our beloved forests. Earlier this month, I met with a fire scientist at the UC Berkeley Fire Lab, Lexi Bernal. She told me that she and other researchers have confirmed that in the past three years, we've lost more than 20% of California's, which is the world's, giant sequoias to wildfire. That's 20%. Big trees with more than 1,000 giant sequoias is the economic backbone to our county. I'm glad we have Heather Reese uh, Reed here, a head of natural resources for the park, to tell us about the efforts to protect big trees from catastrophic fire. You'll also hear, hear from a well-respected forestry expert who has forged strong partnerships with the Forest Service, BLM, and CAL FIRE and helped build a strategic defense system of landscape scale fuel breaks from Murphy's to Camp Connell. 10,000 acres of fuel breaks, that's 1,000 football fields, all done with grants written and executed by a small but mighty all-volunteer team, the CALAM forestry team led by Pat McGreevy, you're remarkable. I was just talking to Pat uh, just a couple of minutes ago, and he reckons it's nine grants and just over six and a half million dollars that he's raised just for our uh, by way of the The main message I'd like to give today is to be prepared. I went to a boarding school, and I was a prefect in my dormitory. We did fire drills every month, and we hated it. <laughs> One morning at 5.30 a.m., the alarm went off, and we groaned at the thought of another drill. All 75 students were out of the building in two and a half minutes. In five minutes, there was nothing left of the four-story structure. This impression has never left me, and I'll be working on how we, as a community, can be doing our own drills and making sure that we are prepared, because these things happen when you least expect it. I urge everyone here today to continue to work together to make the difference. Let's look at our work patterns, new technologies, new equipment, and policy to see if there might be a better way to work together. Lastly, I want to remind everyone to protect your homes from the danger of embers. So many examples over the past few years of fires that burned down homes but left trees standing. This is your cue, Mike. All right. So Marcy Powers pulled these slides together, and what, what this is to show you is how all the houses are going, are gone, but the trees are still standing. And the reason for that, or our main reason for that, is embers. And 
Here you can see that the barn is gone, but the house which they've taken care of isn't. So I learned this when I hired the wild, Wildfire Safety Solutions to do a report of my home. I hadn't even thought of this. Embers can travel up to five miles. Some say one or two. Google says five. Yeah. What's the truth, Mike? <laughs> I'd say yeah. I wouldn't even put a limit on it. Don't put a limit on it. Sorry. <laughs> and they build up in places you wouldn't think of. It's important to cover every possible entry into your homes with a one eight one eight inch mesh. Uh, again, I had no idea that the, that embers. What it is is the embers collect and they find corners to collect and it's when they collect that, that they can create the fire. Uh, now I'd like to introduce you to John Parks. John Parks will be speaking about his new role with the county, your homes, and of course how this all relates to wildfire. Thank you so much. Also, I can I say, I, I really don't monitor uh, Facebook and, and social media on a regular basis. I love my business cards. And if you have any uh, issues or you want to reach me directly, please reach out directly. My phone number is on there and my email. So thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is John Parks, and I am your new county fire inspector. Um, with support from the nine fire chiefs in the districts, the Joint Powers Authority, the Building Department, uh, and the Board of Supervisors, the county has been working um, on a new fire prevention program. Now, many of you might remember back uh, 20, 25 years ago, there was a county fire department before they became districts, and there was a fire prevention bureau with a fire marshal. Then it went away, and it was clear um, at some point in the near past with all these fires that there was a need for a to revitalize or rebirth the uh, County Fire Prevention Bureau. Um, so I recently retired after 30 years of the fire service. Um, I was uh, hired in 1988 uh, with the CDF, which is now Cal Fire. Uh, went to Milpitas for a few years and then spent about 25 years at the city of Palo Alto. Um, the last 13 years of my career there, I was uh, promoted to senior fire inspector and uh, arson investigator and the president of the Santa Clara County Arson Task Force. Yeah. I am honored to be able to bring these experiences to Calaveras County. Um, the county fire prevention is in its infancy stages of development, um, but has plans to provide the citizens with a much needed fire prevention and education that is focused on the county and the nine fire districts. Along with CAL FIRE's uh, annual fire mitigation and inspection program, the County Bureau will provide our citizens information, inspections, and public education. Um, bring, uh, by bringing the 21st century technology to the county through software applications, GPI, the GIS mapping, and data gathering and retention, the fire prevention will be a valued resource um, not only for the county, but other agencies in the, within the state in regards to sharing information as the time passes, especially when it comes to fire mitigation and current fire situations as they happen. Lastly, the Fire Prevention Bureau will definitely benefit the entire county in regards to the ISO rating. If you're not familiar with ISO rating, that's the insurance service organization that rates us from one to 10, one being the best. And uh, we've actually had a couple of uh, ISO uh, interviews here with San Andreas and also in the City of Angels Camp. And just because we have another person involved in fire inspections and in the county, there has helped with their ratings, which can possibly lower your insurance premiums. Um, uh, anyway, uh, one of the things I wanted to share with you that uh, I was promoted in 2008 to the um, Fire Inspection Bureau in Palo Alto. At that time, we were ISO rated three, and it took us till 19, uh, 2014, but working really hard on that, we actually got it down to number one, which is only three in the state. So I'm very proud to be part of that program and want to bring those experiences to you. Um, Supervisor Hibberty, Hibberty uh, talked about embers. Um, you know, uh, how far they can go. And some of my experiences I will share with you is that um, my third year after leaving, well, first year after leaving Cal Fire, when I was with Milpitas, I had the unfortunate opportunity of being at the Oakland Hills Fire, which was, I thought was gonna be the worst fire I'd ever seen. 
But in my tenure, there's been other fires uh, that I've had the unfortunate opportunity to investigate with the task force, which has been Coffee Park, Paradise, and some of the other horrible California fires that we've had. So the embers do fly, they, uh, and they're, they're a really big cause for you know, getting caught up in those areas of your home. So the, uh, you know, clearing the homes 30 feet, 100 feet, as Cal Fire has that specifications on their website, it's really, really important um, you know, that we maintain those. Um, you know, I, I, this is a, it's a high fire area, high fire danger area that we live in. Um, and uh, I'm just, I'm hoping that this program will be very, very successful and be something that this community is very proud to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so just an a introduction of, uh, of Heather. I'll get back to it again. Yeah. She uh, <laughs> is a fantastic asset to the community. She's also my neighbor, so I have to say really nice things. So she got uh, four rocks and being my drive by her house. She's, uh, she's fantastic. She works really super hard up at our state park and um, a local from the area. And we truly value what you do for us up there. And uh, take it away. I'll, I'll say it over here in case your clicker doesn't work and I'll go for it on you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Yeah. I'm Heather Reed. I am the National Resources Program Manager for what we call the Central Valley District of State Parks. We have 14 parks in our district. We're acquiring one more park called Dos Rios, so we'll have 15 parks. But of course, the whole reason we're here is for Calaveras Big Trees in our community. I to give you a little background of, of me is I grew up here. This is being in this building, it just brings back so many memories because I had preschool in this building. <laughs> I cherish this building. So I've been here for 50 years. I, as this month, I've been with State Parks for 20 years. And I know, it's crazy, I didn't realize that. But yeah, so I, I'm very embedded in the community. I love our area. And when I started with State Parks, and started moving through the ranks and realized that we, we needed to do more than just manage the forest for the park, but we also needed to manage the boundaries of the park for the community and also for the park. Because you know we're afraid of fire coming into the park from the community, as well as you're all afraid of fire coming from the park into the community. So we have been trying to do a lot of efforts there. But today what I'm going to talk about is what we've done in the past. And, and I think I do, I'm doing this because a lot of people are new to the area. They don't know that we have a long history of forest management, including prescribed fire. And then I want to bring up what we're doing presently. So let's see if this is going to work. Nope. It's not. There we go. Ah, you're wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> forgot Mike's got in control. So the mission statement of State Parks is to provide for the health, inspiration, and education of the people of California by helping to preserve the state's extraordinary biological diversity protecting its most valued natural and cultural resources, and creating opportunities for high quality recreation. Then, we kind of narrow this down a little more in our what we call our Natural Resource Division, and we have some guiding management concepts and principles. And so we have natural resource, resources will be managed to preserve the composite whole of physical and biological processes, features, and native plant and animal communities. And then whenever possible, natural processes will be relied upon to maintain native plant and animal species and to influence natural fluctuations and populations of these species. And then just this morning, I went into our prescribed fire policy, and it's the policy of the department to restore fire to its proper role in native ecosystems in accordance with the broader change to restore and perpetuate natural ecological processes in the natural environments of the state park system. 
So I just want to let you know that we have different guiding principles than our, our um, sister agencies, Cal Fire, Forest Service, even our local agencies like CCWD land. So you know, when, when we're talking about ecological processes, we may not be using mastication as people have asked us to do, but it's not something that's out of our toolbox. You know, we, we will have areas that are proper for it, but not everywhere in the park. <laughs> so this is just a, a map of the park, so you can see where, you know, all the boundary of the park. And right in here is Blue Lake Springs, and then Big Trees Village is right here, and then you have Love Creek and the Smith property all in here. And then the, the uh, Stanislaus River, you know, runs through the park, so the park's on the Calaveras and Tuolumne sides. So these folks here, why don't we have them up? These are forefathers and mother of prescribed burning at Calaveras Big Trees. So Gary, what is the last name? Gary Wolford. He was a park ranger in 1977, and you can see things have definitely changed. He's in just some regular clothes and doing a broadcast burn. Right here is Harold Biswell, who is the father of prescribed burning. And then we have, then we have Mrs. Bradley, Adrian Bradley, who had a definite huge role in the protection of the South Grove. And you know, they planted a grove themselves, so we have the, the Memorial Bradley Grove in the park. And then my predecessor, Wayne Harrison, who was instrumental in continuing the prescribed burning efforts at Big Trees and, and until he retired in the mid early 2000s. Okay, so our first prescribed burn at, the big, at Big Trees was November 18, 1975. This started off uh, in the South Road, and they continued to burn until about 1981, where they had burned the entire perimeter of, or not the perimeter, the entire area of the South Road. This map here shows a fire history of so here's all the burning they did in that time period in the South Road. And this goes from 1981 all the way to 1995 of all the different areas that have had prescribed fire in the past. Then this next map goes from 1999 to 2000. So this map really is showing some, some plots that they had identified. And not every one of them were burnt, but I can say that our, this area was burnt. That's our Skull Creek area. And we burnt in this area also. The next we have, this is where I, I am more involved in this now, is this area here, we, when I first started in 2003, we started doing forest management there. We did a large prescribed run in this whole area, and we also hit this little tip. Oh, my, my thing turned around somehow. Uh, so imagine that it's the right way. <laughs> And it's rotated the right way. And so this is a little area we call, or this whole area is on the perimeter of the South Road, and we call it the Big Trees National Forest. And it was acquired by the National um, Forest Service, and it is an old growth sugar pine forest. So we acquired some funding so we could do some forest management and uh, including prescribed burning in that area. Next is the North Grove. And so that was my first 
project as a project manager, we received funding through the Sierra Nevada Conservancy to re do restoration efforts in the North Road. That did not include prescribed burning at the time. It was just fuels reduction and pile burning. So this is really when I really took over and I thought about what we really need to do to protect the North Road. A little lower. A little lower? Okay. Sorry, I keep going up and down. <laughs> so what do we need to do to protect the North Road and what we do what we need to do to protect the community? So I created this map in hopes that we could find funding so we could continue our restoration efforts. And, and then next, we got more funding for that Big Trees National Forest area. Next. And then finally, the, the California Conservation Corps had a program with their veterans, where they were putting veterans back to work. And, and so I delved into that. We've got, we got some CCC crews. We have them do a 300-foot, what we call a shaded field break. And yes, it's a little more of leaving more trees, a little more shrub than uh, what you would see like on SBI land or other lands. And we also did the same efforts at Blue Lake Springs area. And then we did not have enough funding to complete this. So we also acquired some funding through our department's grant program and received that to strengthen our work in the North Road. Um, another pot of money we got is a 400 acre forest restoration project with piles. And so we're continuing to work on that. We still have lots of piles to burn there. We also received another grant funding from Sierra Nevada Conservancy to manage this area. This is Big Trees Village. And so we were connecting this shaded field break that we did with our North Grove Forest Restoration and did this, what we call the Big Tree Creek Forest Restoration Project. So that's back to that map. So you'll see that we've worked here, we've worked here, uh, we've done a little bit on the boundary here at that point. And then at this stage, we brought in another gentleman who, his name is Ben Jacobs. He's a fire ecologist and he's our burn boss who has worked for the National Park Service and U.S. Forest Service doing prescribed burning in giant sequoia forests for over 20 years. So he comes in and he says, you guys have this grant, giant sequoia forest resilience grant, and you know, you're doing it on ridge tops, but we really need to protect the parks infrastructure and the giant sequoias. So we move this around and it ends up being pretty similar to what I was thinking too. So uh, we, you can change it to the next. Um, okay, you know, you can go next. So we're gonna go into the present. We're gonna go into the present. Yeah. So currently, with all the grant funding that we have done, had, we have burnt all of these areas here. We've done prescribed fire in all of these areas. We, this year, we're going to be doing what we call the maintenance unit, the West Moran unit, and possibly our East Moran unit. And then in a couple of years, we're going to come back, and it'll be about seven years, and we're going to do a re-entry into that area. This is just a wider view of this is the North Road, this is the internal portion of the North Road, and this is the outer skirts that we have already done prescribed burning, and we this year we will be preparing to do prescribed burning in the fall in the North Road. So then 
the governor's wildfire enforced resilience program came into play for state parks that was a big pot of money so that way we could actually do work without having to find grants to do this work so now we've got some funding and we're calling it our five-year plan and so we have all of these units marked out during so the pink is 2002 uh, the and we're kind of where we are behind and 2023 we have units 2024 so we're we're continuing our uh, uh, plot preparation we're reducing fuels we'll be doing prescribed fire in those areas and so that was the north, so that was the Calaveras side of the park. And then the Tuolumne side of the park, these are the other units we have, oops, we have designated. However, this right here has changed quite a bit. So when our original plan was that we were going to do fuel thinning, pile burning, and then we were going to follow up with prescribed burning. Fast forward to the Castle Fire, the Canopy Complex Fire, all those fires that took out 20% of giant sequoias. We realized we don't have time. We don't have time to do all of this work that would take us another 10 years to get to that point. We need to prep this unit. We fast forward? Yep. Fast forward. <laughs> I'm on over you, the VCR. <laughs> Uh, so we are prepping the whole of the 1,300-acre um, South Grove unit for a prescribed burn. What this is entailing is we have lots of dead snags all around the perimeter that we've had to remove. We have, we're working on a biomass contract to get that all removed. We have been, all of our crews are out there, they're removing fuel away from the giant sequoias. They're removing fuel away from our large old growth sugar pines and ponderosa pines. They're, uh, they're, uh, we've worked with U.S. Forest Service. We're now in an agreement with U.S. Forest Service that when we're ready to prescribe burn, we can call them up and they can be there. We're working with our partners, Cal Fire, who are, you know, they're instrumental in us doing this work together. And, and we're working with National Park Service, so we're getting an agreement with them so we can use their drone program, who will come in and help us do the ignition efforts in there. So once again, uh, um, this is big trees, and our goal is to restore and maintain robust giant sequoia groves and a healthy forest. Uh, and to let you know, you know, why am I saying all this? I just want to let you know we're really doing our efforts to protect that park from catastrophic fire and to protect the park, the public and our community from catastrophic fire from coming into the park. So is anybody, are we doing questions? Yeah. Yeah. If I have time, okay, I have time for questions, so. Question? Yes. Yeah, um, uh, just wondering, it's not on. There you go. Okay, that there a shot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know that you had planned on burning the 1,300 acres last season. Excuse me. Yes. I know that you had planned on burning the 1,300 acres, and you were right up to the, you know, to the point where you're going to burn it, and you had to back off. So I know you're going to try it again. And what if you never find another window for that for the, for, for that area, you know? Because the windows seem to be shorter and shorter for prescribed burns. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. So, you know, that will be something that we're going to have to revisit if it comes to where we don't get those windows. Then we will have to revisit, and we will have to probably take that longer path of getting that that area restored. Excuse me. Counter counter question. Yeah. Okay, the longer path, if it's 10 years of no windows, what kind of path is that? Well, we're not going to wait 10 years. What's so, the alternative? So the alternative is like, is what I described, where we're going to, we would come in, do some contracts, we'd have to reduce fuels in there, create piles, pile burn, and then we'd have to come in and do a prescribed burn. Mm. So we're just, 
you know, we're all we, hoping for that opportunity and we're all pretty much getting in line so this fall we can do this work. Excellent. Uh, any other questions for Heather before we move on to the next presenter? Heather, you're going to stick around for a little bit? Oh. oh. Well, I'll, I'll use my teacher voice. <laughs> yeah, and then the other thing that uh, is involved with in this kind of cleanup is it has to be maintained. Yes. You have to come back and do it again and again at appropriate intervals. So I just wanted to mention that it, it's not a one and done type of thing. You're very right, Vita. So one thing is, you know, you saw those history, those those history maps of our prescribed burning, and you're thinking, well, I did all these efforts. Shouldn't that forest be really healthy? And and you know, we don't need to do anything. Well, because of the funding issues, folks weren't able to go back every seven to ten years to go burn. So we're hoping that in the future that we can have, you know, ongoing funding so that way we can continue and make sure that we're going in at those intervals and continuing those prescribed fire efforts to make, to, to continue forward towards a healthy forest. So I lost the thought, never mind. It might come back to me. <laughs> yeah, they're talking about the, you now have, you're training your own people to work on this. Uh, doing the fire prescribed oh, burning. No, we've always had our own people doing this. They're going fire. to all the so, classes. Oh yeah. Uh, so yeah, so we we invest a lot of money on our on our permanent and our seasonal staff. Once so we just hired a whole bunch of new seasonal staff and the first month is is basic fire, chainsaw training, and then we you know, dependent on in the program uh, who is doing what, we're, we're continuing all of their fire education. We train them on uh, every other Thursday. They do a full, full day of training. We invest in, in them because, you know, we, the department, we, we pride ourselves in that we're prescribed fire managers. But we also need to learn suppression. You know, not always are is health fire going to be right there where, hey, we have a little escape. Are they going to be there? No, we need to know how to control and be suppression. Not maybe not specialists, but we're you know we learn those suppression efforts and we make it you know uh, we do every effort we can to to be in the game with health fire. Hey, thanks a lot, Heather. We're going to go ahead and move through the uh, agenda now. Uh, let's give a round of applause to Heather. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. You use the clicker, the left click here, or I can do it for you. Go ahead, yeah, yeah, if you, if you don't mind, yeah. All right, so um, this is some of the topics that I'm going to address today. Um, undergrounding, overhead system hardening, um, some of the projects in this community here. Uh, vegetation <laughs> management, which is tree trimming, tree removal, um, public safety power shutoffs, and the enhanced public power, enhanced power line safety settings. Okay. Mm -hmm. So these are the three main goals. Um, our community wildfire safety program has uh, evolved quite a bit over the last five years or so. Um, when we've had the, the extreme fire danger years that continue to get worse and worse. Um, obviously, we want to do everything we possibly can to prevent wildfires. Um, and we also want to reduce impacts to the community. We realize that when we have uh, power shutoffs or when we have power outages, it's very impactful to the community. Um, and we realize that a lot of the wildfire prevention efforts that we do lead to more power outages. Um, so we want to do our best to, to reduce those impacts while also keeping in mind always the goal is preventing wildfires. Um, and then, of course, supporting our customers in every way we possibly can. So situational awareness. So uh, we've been on a quest uh, throughout our entire service territory uh, to install weather stations. We've installed over 400 of them throughout pg and &E service territory. You can see on the map there are 39 of them throughout Calaveras County. Uh, we've covered the county pretty well, um, covered most of the areas where we have a, a lot of power lines and high fire threat areas. Um, also fire cameras. Uh, we've worked a lot with uh, various responding agencies 
um, to set wildfire cameras up. Uh, these are all available, uh, viewable at all times um, for the, the public. Um, there is a, a University of Utah project called Meso West where they host all of these cameras. You can, you can see cameras from basically any fire lookout anywhere in the state um, at any given time on that website. So I recommend you check it out, it's pretty cool. So let's talk a bit about uh, undergrounding we're gonna talk about first. So you are probably aware that um, PG&E CEO Patty Poppy a couple years ago announced that PG&E was gonna do 10,000 miles of undergrounding of power lines in high fire threat areas. Uh, that is going to be the biggest undergrounding of power line effort that any utility anywhere in the world has ever undertaken. So we are really still at the very beginning stages of that, um, but I'm gonna show you some work that we have planned in Calaveras County. There's some good projects around here um, that we're pretty excited to roll out this year. So, um, next slide please. So this is kind of an overview countywide. Um, you can see we only did about one mile of undergrounding last year. This year we have about 16. Way too loud. Way too loud. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> can you All right. This time we have about 16. This year we have about 16 miles in the forecast. Um, and then next year, about 25 miles. You can see that a lot of those miles are here in the Highway 4 corridor. Um, and we'll, we'll go through uh, in more detail uh, the Arnold projects and the Murphy's projects. So next up. Um, so this is uh, the underground and work that we have planned for this year in Arnold. Um, what you see on the screen is this year's work, about eight miles of it. Um, this is the Mustang Drive or Mustang Road, Lightning Lane, uh, Moran Road area of Arnold. Um, this is an area where the county has a lot of paving projects slated. Um, so we are in very close coordination with the county. Supervisor Hubbardy has been a very big help in bringing all the parties together there. Um, ideally, we would like to get this work done and then get out of the way and then have the county come in and pave so we only have to disturb this neighborhood one time. Um, so we are very, very much working uh, with the county to try to make that happen this year. Um, so you can see this is quite a bit of, of undergrounding work. Um, so if you live in this area, uh, I ask that you bear with us because you know there's going to be a lot of road disruptions, traffic disruptions. Um, but when it's all done, it's going to lead to a, a very big benefit uh, to this area having so many of the power lines under there. So uh, moving on to Murphy's, um, Murphy's has, does have some work planned for this year, about seven miles of it planned for this year, and then about 13 miles next year. Um, so you see there, a lot of it does kind of follow a lot of main line on Highway 4. Um, so Pennsylvania Gulch Road has a big project on it, Crestview. Um, so this is, again, you know, if you live down the hill in Murphy's, I, I ask you to bear with us. It's going to be, it's going to be impactful, but, you know, these are all... Uh, very necessary work, very necessary projects that need to get done. Um, you know, we, if we're gonna do 10,000 miles of undergrounding, um, you know, I, I tell all my coworkers, we need to bring it to this area because we have one of the high fire threat areas in the state here. So um, the undergrounding work is rolling out and it's gonna continue to do so over the next uh, probably eight to 10 years. So uh, in addition to undergrounding of lines, we've done a lot of projects we call overhead system hardening. Um, a lot of these are projects where we replace some of the traditional wooden poles um, with uh, hardier composite material poles. Um, we replace a lot of the overhead wire with what we call tree wire. It's a thicker coated wire, um, hopefully more resistant to if something runs into the wire, if a tree falls through it or something like that. Um, it could hopefully withstand that a little better. It's not going to be perfect. Um, you know, we still see uh, plenty of, of outages, especially we, we saw some this winter through storms and that kind of thing. Um, but it is better. We do we do prevent outages and we certainly prevent um, uh, wires breaking and starting fires with that. So you can see we have a, a good bit of work um, that we've done uh, in most of what we've done so far in the county is here along the Highway 4 corridor. Um, and we're going to be continuing to do that over the next couple of years. Couple of the projects, you guys are probably uh, well aware of this, um, especially you know what you've seen out there last year. A lot of the the, the change out to the poles and so forth that have been done. Next slide. Yeah, again, same thing. Um, you know, mostly mainline kind of work. Mostly follows. You know, the, our our lines tend to follow roads and thoroughfares and highways and so forth. So, all right, let's talk about vegetation management. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we're doing in, in this area, what we're doing in general, we what the program the is. Audio? So, no. I think so. Yeah. Did you yeah. lose the audio? Let's we'll trade. Oh, no, no, I think he just All right. turned off. No, I think, I think the battery ran. Right. Right. Oh, okay. uh, so um, we'll see if I can get this one right. Uh, so vegetation management, next step, please. Um, so obviously, you know, we have 
about 100,000 miles of overhead power lines throughout our service territory, um, about 70,000 miles of lines in high fire threat areas. Um, so we have a huge, robust, uh, ever-expanding vegetation management program where we have to inspect trees annually. Um, we have to address hazard trees, dead trees, um, you know, trees that have grown to a point where they overhang our lines. All of that. So um, all of you that live up here are probably very familiar with this. You probably hear from us a lot um, and our contractors a lot. Um, so next up, please. So we have over 1,500 miles of power lines in higher fire threat areas just in Calaveras County alone. So um, it is a big, never-ending job um, to continually inspect the trees around those lines uh, to continue to maintain our clearances. Um, so yeah, again, you, you, I, I, I'm not telling you you anything you don't already know. You, you uh, hear from us a lot on this. Um, next up. Um, so one of the things I wanted to say, uh, oftentimes when I go and do public presentations like this, people will have specific questions about their property, vegetation work on their property. I would love to help with those. Um, I will stick around afterwards. So I ask that if you have specific questions specific to your property, um, I'd be glad to take your, your name and address and phone number and all that and see what we can do to help with those. Um, so yeah, we, uh, you know, again, we're, we're constantly out there inspecting and doing the work and all of that. And we've seen a lot of dividends, you know, we've seen, um, I think th this, this winter for as brutal as the storm season was, um, we, we saw less impacts of power outages. You know, it, it, it's, it's never gonna be down to zero, but I think we saw a good amount of progress that comes with the system hardening work and the tree work that we've done. So next up. All right, let's talk public safety power shutoffs now. Um, so this is a program that we rolled out uh, in 2018. Um, that was the first year that we actually proactively shut off power to prevent wildfires. Um, uh, 2019 was the year that things really uh, started in earnest. Um, I'll show a slide next where we, uh, that shows comparison year over year. So, so those of you that lived up here in 2019, um, <laughs> you went through the, the real worst of it. Um, that year we had a lot of very impactful outages, over 2 million customers impacted throughout our service territory by public safety power shutoffs that year. Um, the biggest event that we had in 2019, we turned off power to 930,000 customers throughout our service territory. So that's probably about 3 million people um, where we turned power off to in one day. Um, uh, that in that event, almost the entirety of, of Calaveras County was out of power, even down in Angels Camp, Copperopolis. Um, so if you can go back to that, that last slide, please. Um, so we have, after that year in 2019, where we had the majorly impactful outages, we knew that that was not sustainable and that had to get better. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've worked uh, on a lot of initiatives to make power shutoffs a lot smaller, make them less frequent, make us not have to do them nearly as often. Um, so we, and what you see here uh, is that we have, over the years, we've gotten a lot better um, at how many customers we're impacting with these public safety power shutoffs. Um, so we, we, we really uh, honed in on trying to only turn the power off to areas that are really greatly impacted at any given time with high winds. Um, and high fire threat conditions. Last year, we didn't have a single event, uh, which was good. Um, you know, a lot of that is weather driven, um, but you know, there, there is a lot of dividends, again, that are paid from, from a lot of the work that we do out there to try to really make these things as, as small as, as they possibly need to be. Um, I believe, if I remember right, in 2021, we didn't have any events that impacted Calaveras County. So I think the last two years running, we haven't had any power shut off events here. Um, so, uh, knock on wood, uh, say a prayer, whatever to you, whatever you uh, believe to keep that uh, streak rolling this year. Um, if we do have events, um, we, we, we again, we are confident that they will be smaller and a lot more surgical than they have been in years past. So, and you, um, Enhanced Power Line Safety Center. So this is a program that we rolled out a couple of years ago. Um, what this basically is, is we, during the, the high fire threat times of the year, um, we adjust the sensitivity settings on the power lines so that if there's an interruption, um, they're supposed to what we call fast trip um, and, and turn off right away. So what these do, what these have led to, here the next slide, um, we've seen a great reduction in ignitions caused by power lines since we rolled this program out. 68% reduction in ignitions, 99% reduction in fire size. These are fires that, you know, again, are caused by when our lines get obstructed. Um, what this also leads to is 
larger and longer power outages throughout the summer, as you all well know. Um, so we are doing everything we can um, to try to make those power outages as least impactful as possible. But with this program does come increased outages. So that is a, you know, a, a, a kind of a fact of life that you guys have been living with up here. Um, you know, obviously a lot of the circuits in Calaveras <laughs> are affected by this. Um, once we get into the summer, again, those, those uh, sensitivity settings will be adjusted. So when we have outages, they're likely to be larger outages, longer outages. We're doing everything we can to, to you know, mitigate that. So next up, please. So what are the difference between uh, public safety power shutoff and enhanced power line safety settings? Well, the main difference is uh, the public, public safety power shutoff is planned. You know, we spend a week or so um, with working with the weather forecast, honing in on where exactly we need to turn the power off, and we intentionally turn the power off uh, during those events. Uh, enhanced power, power line safety setting outages are not planned. They happen because um, something obstructed our lines. Usually that means an animal, um, or sometimes a vehicle, sometimes a tree, um, actually got into our lines. So these are outages that, that happen because of you know uh, factors beyond our control. Um, but what we do control is the settings that make the outages uh, bigger and longer, um, and hopefully you know reduce the the chance of causing an ignition when something does run into one of those lines. Um, so the notification procedure is a lot different. Um, in, in public safety power shutoffs, you will get all kinds of calls and text messages and uh, emails from us. You may even get tired of hearing from us when we have those events in the forecast. Um, in the enhanced power, power line safety setting outages, um, again, they're not planned, so, so you won't hear from us until the outage actually happens. Um, and then we have to get out there and patrol the lines um, and you know hopefully get it back up as quickly as possible. So this is kind of the process um, that we go through. Uh, when an object strikes the line, um, we, if we can, we will get a helicopter up and fly the line. Um, sometimes it needs to be on foot, though. A lot of that depends on the time of the day. Um, we can't see much from the helicopters at night. So um, if we have an outage late in the day, a lot of times that, that leads to it going overnight. Um, next slide, please. So this is, again, kind of the, uh, the process that we have to go through um, whenever one of these things happens. Um, so hopefully we, we've tried a lot to get better in the, the last couple years uh, with the patrolling for one thing, but also with the communications with the customers when these power outages happen. So, next up. So this is the last slide that I have. Um, some of, I'll leave this, this up on the screen uh, for a while. Some of the resources that we have to support our customers. Um, there's a lot of information out there. Um, there, is a, there are a lot of um, programs that our customers could take advantage of uh, for portable batteries, self-generation, um, customers that have medical needs that require electricity. We have a special program that uh, if you do have that, hopefully you're signed up for our medical baseline program. Um, it does lead to a reduction in the bill, but also leads to um, us doing enhanced outreach to those medically vulnerable customers anytime we have outages. Um, so again, I, I wanna thank you all for, for having me today. Um, you know, we, we certainly understand that a lot of these disruptions of power are very impactful, but you know, please bear with us. We appreciate everybody's support and patience as we really try to get better at uh, making our communities more fire safe and more fire resilient. So um, I'd be happy to take questions. Okay. It's not a question, it's a comment. Um, I just like to thank you for your excellent communication because we can be in the dark literally, but we, we know that it's either um, something that just happened that impacted the lines or, you know, we'll get a letter that says schedule this day, right. this is how we're shut up, shut up. Um, it's just really appreciated because then you can get through it a little easier. So I, I appreciate you saying that, you know, we, um, uh, we've re in the beginning of especially the, the enhanced power line safety setting program, we did not do a very good job of rolling that out and communicating with our customers. And we realize that, um, and we are really, you know, trying to get better all the time at those communications. So I appreciate you saying that. I should have also mentioned, you mentioned planned outages. Um, you know, a lot of this work that we have to do, this system hardening work requires planned outages. You know, our crews cannot work on those lines while they're hot. So a lot of times we have to turn those lines off to get this work done. So um, you know we're required to provide at least two weeks notice when we have the planned outages. 
Um, so a lot of times you will get a letter or an email on that. So um, again, the, 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 the theme of the presentation, um, we appreciate your patience because you know we know this is inconvenient, but it is certainly toward a greater good. So thank you. Um, so first, thank you for all the work that you have done. I've been very blessed about it this year. Um, and I appreciate you um, taking care of the trees by the power lines, but many of us have had trees that have been cut down and then the logs are left there and we're expecting, they say, oh, three, you know, within three months, someone will come and pick it up, but that does not seem to be the case. Yeah, and, and that is one of the most frequent uh, complaints that I hear from people. Um, so I, I would be happy to talk to you about your, your individual properties in that regard. Um, you know, we, particularly through this winter, when we had a lot of really adverse uh, conditions, we were really behind on a lot of the wood removal. Um, you know, we do still have our wood removal contractors in place. We do still have the wood removal program in place. Um, so again, all I can ask is patience. I mean, we, we're trying our best to get that done. Um, it's not always the, the quickest and most efficient thing. I realize that. Um, but, you know, I, I'm always happy to talk to people about their individual concerns and usually we're able to, to get those addressed. So, yeah, thank you. I hear from Supervisor Hubbardy a lot. I hear from uh, his counterparts in, in Amador County a lot, you know, um, from when he hears from constituents that have concerns, he gets those to me and we do our best. To That's what I wanted to them. say. I wanted to reiterate what you had said earlier is to say thank you because in the middle of the night, Anytime during the day, you've always been honest and accurate about exactly what's going on, and that's it's been brilliant. And thank you for all the work to make this this huge storm year a little bit easier for everybody, because there were, there were very few comparatively what we could have thought of, of how many people would have lost power. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thanks for all that. I, you know, I I kept thinking the storm season might be over, and then uh, <laughs> it doesn't really look like that. So we're going to take one more quick okay. question, yeah. and then you're going to stick around yep. so yep. others can. Sidebar with you. Yep. Um, I'm Ben Arnold, and I know that the drones are in place with PG&E. Um, are you going to make it very clear to folks that drones are in our neighborhoods? Because some neighborhoods don't like drones. Yeah, understood. And I think that needs to get out. That right. Messaging. Yeah, understood. Um, yeah, so we we recognize that we need to do a better <laughs> job of notifying customers you know, when the drone work is going to happen. Um, the, the drones have been very effective for us in doing inspections. Um, we're actually currently working on um, trying to get the FAA, the Federal Administration, uh, Federal Aviation Administration, to loosen some of their requirements about uh, line of sight for drones so that we can do even more of those inspections with drones. I can imagine a world where we, you know, even overnight when we have a power outage, we're able to deploy the drones out there with lights and, and you know, maybe get the power back on before the morning. The work, we're not there yet, we're a long way from there. Um, but, you know, the technology has a lot of promise. Um, and so I, I do understand, um, you know, I wouldn't probably be wild about a drone flying in my neighborhood as well. Um, so we, we do need to get better about the notifications on that, and that is something that we recognize. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think you're going to continue to see more and more of that and, and you know, hopefully hear more from us about it ahead of time. So I, I do appreciate that feedback. All right. Thank you very much, Dylan. Uh, round of applause. All. all right. So our next uh, victim, I mean, uh, uh -huh. is, my, uh, is my partner at Cal Fire, Dennis Lang, 4414. Uh, Again, another tremendous asset. And Emily Kilgore is also here. My name is Dennis Lang. I am the new battalion chief here up in the Arnold Battalion, Battalion 4. Uh, I just started here in uh, at the end of January, beginning of February. So I'm looking forward to meeting a lot of folks out here. Uh, it's a big learning curve for me to learn the area. Uh, I have five fire down here, but now I'm uh, working down here. So it's a good, great privilege for me to be down here and meet the different folks. So bear with me on some of the uh, technical questions and stuff. Just trying to learn how to get around and learn the area and learn the community and the folks out here. And then uh, we're going to kind of tag team this uh, with Emily and myself. So uh, we've got a few slides for you. So basically in the Arnold Battalion, uh, we have two stations. The one here in Arnold just 
uh, west of town, and then Skull Creek out in the SPI property to the south, is which is actually in the Tuolumne County, but it's quicker for us to have it on this side, so that's one of the uh, stations that I uh, manage. We have uh, two Type 3 engines, and with that, we have uh, total personnel, four captains, four engineers, and 15 firefighters. When we're fully staffed, so we're still uh, getting folks in. We just started staffing uh, both engines on 24, so we'll have another rehire here in a couple of weeks and uh, fully engaged with uh, what we got going with that battalion. My truck's still going to be so this is just to kind of give you an idea about um, where we need to get back to. This image was taken um, not in the Tuolumne Calaveras unit, but um, in one of the neighboring units, and it is very indicative what, of what would have been seen as the forest uh, around the turn of the century um, in 1909. And as you can see, there's not a lot of fuel buildup. It's very easy to walk through. Horses can get through. There's um, some vegetation that they um, can dine on, um, but it's very open. Um, this is almost 40 years later in this exact same location. And as you can see, there's starting to be some um, ladder fuel buildup, some smaller trees coming in, and things are starting to get crowded, but they could still walk through the forest. And then this is in 1989, so 80 years after the first picture, same location. Um, you can't even see through it. And this is probably what you're familiar with and what a lot of um, the general public or people that don't live in this environment, this is what they think a healthy forest looks like. Um, but we all know that this is actually creating a problem, not only in forest health, but in our fire management. So what are we gonna do to get back to that? This slide um, kind of shows how all the pieces of the puzzle come together because whose responsibility is, is fire management and forest health? Is it just CAL FIRES? Is it just state parks? Just the Forest Service? Is it just you? Everyone. It's everyone. So when we do fuel reduction, CAL FIRE looks at fuel reduction in a large scale. Excuse me, a little less volume, please. Oh. Can you hear me without the mic? No. <laughs> How about in the very back? Okay, no. I'm gonna go mic for you. <laughs> um, so Cal Fire does large scale fuel reduction projects. When we do our fuel reduction projects, we're looking at areas along ridge tops, highways, and things that we can protect multiple communities with doing the least amount of work and the least amount of money. So we look at long stretches in areas where we're going to protect multiple communities. The federal government, like the Forest Service, BLM, sometimes um, other federal entities, they kind of do the same thing. They're looking for large scale fuel reduction projects, the most bang for their buck, where they can protect the most communities with a little bit of work. Counties have the opportunity to apply for federal grants um, and state grants to do fuel reduction work, and they're kind of similar. They look for multiple community areas, but where you start to break it down is where you see our Firewise communities. How many people here are involved with a Firewise community or your neighborhood is a Firewise community? Very good. Um, the Highway 4 corridor was one of the initial areas where we saw multiple Firewise communities come together um, back in the late 80s and early 90s. Firewise communities look at what we call a moderate scale fuel reduction project. And so they're looking at protecting like a single neighborhood. And then there's the fire safe councils where they're looking at protecting a single neighborhood as well. They also go after um, fi uh, federal funding and state funding, but you're taking that big fuel reduction project, removing all those ladder fuels to protect a single community or a single neighborhood. Then there's 4291. Are you guys all familiar with 42, Public Resource Code 4291? No. no. Okay, well, we're gonna talk a little bit about it. That's all right. Public Resource Code 4291 is um, state-driven. That is your defensible space law. So when your volunteers and preventions through your HOAs or our defensible space inspectors come inspect your property for fuel reduction, that's that 100-foot rule. Public Resource Code 4291 is your private property 
fuel reduction project. All of these things combined, if everybody takes responsibility, provides for fire safety in the entire area. <clears throat> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Technology at its finest. <laughs> call 911. <laughs> <laughs> no, please do not call 911. <laughs> Don't worry, we're going to fix it. Right here. So in the battalion for uh, reduction, fuel reduction projects in cooperation with other entities around, uh, in the past, talking with my partner, uh, Big Tree State Park, we're working with, which Heather talked about, and the prescribed fire that they're doing there and fuel reduction, we assist with them in collaboration with their folks. Last chance fuel break with the Forest Service, uh, Blue Lake Springs, and then uh, the timber harvest plan with SPI in the Love Creek area that surrounds between SPI and the park. And then the Blue Mountain Lookout, which everybody knows lookouts are going away due to technology and cell phones, but it's still important uh, during uh, significant weather events, we will staff that lookout and put individuals in there for early detection to help us and the communities out there. So some of the projects that we work with. Oh, wrong way. <laughs> oh no, went to the slide it doesn't like to get off of. Yeah, oh, no, there. Oh, look. <laughs> yeah. I like that one. Sure I know how to get the owner. Lunch break. <laughs> <laughs> We're almost there. Almost. Almost. I think you can There we go. Sorry about that. So, real quick, we'll just talk a little bit about defensible space, hardening your home, and fire-resistant landscaping. Uh, landscaping, and there are some uh, short videos and stuff that you can look at online that the uh, Cal Fire has come up with to help people with a general idea. I don't know, like anything. He does not like it. Jeez. I'm going to blame it on oh, you. Okay. giving it to him first. I'll do it. Ooh, this is not good. That's a horrible slide. Mm. Let me redo this. Anybody got any sunglasses? Yeah, sorry, that's a word to you. Emily? Yep. Going to. Maybe not. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just you can't read it. It's not liking it. Should have used my computer. Well, they're opening on it. You're welcome to get up and stretch. Oh, okay. All right. We're probably going to have to do that with the next slide, too. Anyhow, defensible space inspections. We touched on it a little bit. It is required by Public Resource Code 4291. It removes fuels from around your structures, and it is the single most important thing that you can do other than hardening your home. Um, to protect your home and also create a safety area um, for firefighters if they need to do structure protection should we encounter a large catastrophic fire. Um, we have in the Tuolumne Calaveras unit, we have a team of defensible space inspectors. We have two seasonal employees and two permanent employees. One of those permanent employees specifically does 4291 inspections under assembly bill 38 which says if you're having a real estate transaction you have to pass 4291 to sell your property uh, the other way that we get help in this unit and it's been a model unit for almost 40 years uh, is the highway four area we have Statewide, we have volunteers in prevention. They do all kinds of different work for us. Uh, but here on Highway 4, 
we created in the Tuolumne Calaveras unit where we partnered with homeowners associations to have volunteers sign up um, with CAL FIRE as a volunteer. We train you to do 4291 inspections. You guys actually go out and do the inspections for us, put it into our database. And if we have non-compliant properties, um, we have the ability to send law enforcement out to um, do citations. But the primary goal of the VIP program is to educate your neighbors about defensible space um, and education. It's not, it's not to go tattletale. Um, but yes. Yeah. I'll just. You want to talk about this one? You want me to talk about this? One? Yeah. It's. Um, so again, VIP program is primarily to educate your um, fellow neighbors about 4291. There's other opportunities as a volunteer, though. I take volunteers to help me with school programs, fairs, parades. Um, if you're tech, tech savvy, you can fix presentations like this for me so I don't come in here looking kind of bad. Um, I have office duty things. I, um, I even have a volunteer who is very limited function and um, he loves working for me. So if you want to explore other options as a volunteer, see me in the back. I'll get you signed up. Um, but uh, we tend to put out anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000 inspections in the unit. The bulk of those have come off the Highway 4 VIP program in the past. Uh, next. So Zone Zero, how many of you are familiar with Zone Zero? It's kind of new. It's kind of new. Um, so Assembly told CAL FIRE that we are going to make our defensible space zones more robust and we're going to adopt Zone Zero. They gave CAL FIRE and the Board of Forestry until January 1st, 2023 to come up with the education portion of what Zone Zero is. Um, and there's still discussion and it hasn't been finally approved by the Board of Forestry and then run through the assembly on exactly what the terms are going to be included in the 4291 law. So some of what I'm going to show you um, may change a little bit, but this is kind of the nuts and bolts of it. Very simply said in one sentence, nothing combustible within five feet of your house. So earlier, um, someone was talking about uh, embers and ember collection, and that's gonna be um, the, the primary thing that impacts your home and your investment. And someone said, well, I don't know how to, to kind of describe how embers do that. I, I describe it very easily. When you go out to rake your leaves and do your pine needles, where those are collecting is exactly where embers are going to collect around your home. So those are the areas you want to ensure are going to be hardened, and those are the areas are, that you're going to want to ensure that you maintain more frequently. 4291 is required year-round. It is not a fire season law. So do that work year-round. In Zone Zero, you're going to look at hardscaping things. Um, so you want to use gravel. I know a lot of homes here are on steep slopes. There is going to be some guidance that comes out on how to deal with erosion issues if that is in your Zone Zero or Zone One area. Zone one, zone one hasn't changed in 4291. You still have to remove all dead and dying vegetation, so pine needles, pine leaves, and sticks. Um, you still have to uh, make sure that your roof is clear, your gutters are clear, you have to have 10 feet of clearance. If you have trees that grow over your home, you need to have at least 10 feet of um, clearance for branches, and you still have to have 10 feet of clearance around your propane tank. None of that has changed. <laughs> Uh, zone zero says to relocate your um, 
Wood piles outside of the five foot zone, zone one also says to relocate it outside into the zone two area. Zone one covers that five foot to, to 30 foot of clearance around your structures. Um, and then the number one infraction that I see in our unit as far as compliance with 4291 is people using the underneath of their deck as storage. That is not storage. <laughs> that is not storage. You shouldn't put anything under there. Um, and if you have the opportunity to enclose the underneath of your deck with fire resistant materials um, from the bottom of the deck all the way down to the ground. So the zone two hasn't changed at all either. This is where you can start seeing larger clusters of vegetation, some of that aesthetic appeal. We all moved up to this area at some point, probably because we liked being in nature. Mm -hmm. So we're not advocating that you have to, you know, make your property denude of any vegetation. This is the area where you get to have it. You want to try to keep your vegetation in a, uh, clusters of 10 feet in diameter with 10 feet of spacing between it. And then for your trees, you want to do the same thing. You need to have at least 10 feet of spacing between the branches, not only for fire safety, but when you look at all those ladder fuels, one of the common problems that you're having there is that where the branches are coming together, the roots are also coming together underground. So those trees are competing for the same nutrients in the soil and the same water and the same sunlight. So let's create a healthy forest instead of having that screen because we don't want to see our neighbor anymore, right? Next. <laughs> um, and then this slide talks about some additional regulations about horizontal and vertical spacing. Um, all of this information is available at my table in the Wildfire Action Plan booklet. Um, so feel free to stop by, but this teaches you how to adjust for slope because um, a lot of the homes around here are on an incline or, um, go ahead. Burn permits. How many of you guys knew that your residential door yard burn permit or any burn permit that we issue is now available online? <laughs> Perfect. I did my job. I got the information out. Uh, not only is it available online, but you are required to use our online system to request one. The residential door yard permit, you'll watch a three minute video, you'll fill out your burning address, and then it will send you an email with your actual permit in it. You can print it out in a digital copy. It, like if you saved a picture of it on your cell phone is also acceptable. That's new this year. The other two kinds of permits that you can get, uh, the general burning one, and this is the one that people are getting confused with. A general burning permit is an LE5 permit. It does require a CAL FIRE person to come inspect your area that you're going to burn. It's typically intended for larger piles and not the individual homeowner that's just burning their small brush. Um, it's usually larger piles, agriculture land, that kind of stuff. The other burn permit is the broadcast burning permit, also available to apply online. That's for prescribed burns. Um, the prescribed burn association is gonna give a presentation here pretty quick and I'll let them talk about what they do, but there is a, a mechanism being developed kind of statewide and here locally where neighbors can help neighbors do broadcast burning on their property. This is the broadcast burning permit is also what other entities need to um, apply for in addition to air quality permits to do pro, uh, burning, open burning basically. And uh, all three are available online. The last two, you don't get your permit generated when you apply. You don't get it until it's approved by the CAL FIRE person inspecting. <clears throat> Next slide. And just one thing on the residential burning, it's a four by four pile with your 10 foot clearance with tool attendance and water. So just because you think your pile might be a five by five and you need to do the other one, just you don't need the pile that big. You can still get your permit and then add just to it to with your clearances minutes. to be able to handle that. And then we don't have to come and inspect. So there's a little bit of confusion and education piece that we're gonna push out. Uh, for the folks that say, I don't have internet, I don't know how to use a computer, we will help assist if you come to the station and guide you through that process. But this way now it's online and it'll have a record. So from year <laughs> forward, forward, you will have that and then it's just a process and a lot better. Uh, if you do have the paper uh, still with you now, 
we will still accept that, but we want to convert everybody over to the new online per <coughs> process. Everybody's paper's permit should have expired on the 30th. Yeah, but some are still out there just in case. So just so come to the another... station, give a call, and we'll help yeah. guide you through that process. And that is another change that has been had um, prior to now. The permits, when you came into the station and you got a handwritten permit, they were valid for two years and expired on April 30th. That's no longer the case. You have to apply for a new burn permit every year. Don't do it in advance of May 1st, because if you do it on April 30th, trying to plan for the next year, your permit's gonna expire at midnight and you still have to go back in on May 1st to get one for that burn season. So make sure you do it every year on May 1st or after. So home hardening, um, I'll touch on this pretty briefly. Um, I have several slides in here, but we're gonna click through them and I'm not gonna cover them. If you have questions about home hardening and the things that you can do, I have several <laughs> brochures back there. But basically with home hardening is, we don't advocate that you have to completely rebuild your entire home or do a full structure remodel so that you're fire compliant. But when you're doing things, especially a lot of homes up here are, are aging, uh, when you're doing things like replacing your roof or looking at your gutters or wanting to rebuild your deck, do so with fire resistance in mind. There is materials out there that you can use that are less combustible. I have a full list of low cost ways that you can harden your home back there. Um, but most importantly, just keep that in mind. We're, I'm not saying you have to go rebuild your entire house, but when you're making those repairs, do it with fire resistant materials. And just a couple of little things on the rain gutters and stuff. Try to go for, if you're going to replace your gutters, is make sure they're clean. If you can put the gutter guards on there, really helps you when everybody's out of the area to help defend that a little better. And the biggest thing I want to push out between us as first responders and my department, ambulance, whatever, is address. Uh, to know your numbers on your street. So it might be on, good on your house, but how long how many people have long driveways and if we it's not posted at the driveway it's really hard for us to get there in a timely and efficient manner if we see your house at 2400 highway 4 and it's there in big reflective it's awesome for us that way there's no question for us to get there so if you just take that one little bit and put that out there when you guys go home today and go i think i can do better on my address I'll, really helpful. I'll piggyback that a little bit. Not only have it at the main highway or the main road, but if there's additional intersections, because there's multiple driveways leading into your house, put your address at those intersections as well. So like for me, I have to turn down three easement roads to get to my house. I have my address posted at every single intersection. Um, and then as far as access is also concerned, our equipment is getting bigger and taller every time we come out with a new a new model so make sure that you have at least 12 feet of vertical um, clearance all the way down your driveway and at least 10 feet wide and your gates open in towards your property not out because if they open in and we have to make access quickly we can push on them but if they open out then we're not going to get chains and try to pull it out we're probably either going to bypass your home or we have to get in on foot and i just i just want to let everybody know that the those uh, address signs are it, they light up at night and you can get them through the sheriff's department the reflective signs yep thank you um if you have any questions my phone number to my office is up here i also have business cards with my email address you can get a hold of me at any time if you're interested in a what i call an educational inspection because you're new to the area and you don't know what 4291 is and you want someone to come tell you about it i will come to your house um, as i have availability and do an educational inspection work through the entire inspection process with you make recommendations and then it's up to you to choose which of those recommendations you do uh, yeah, sure. we can do questions now or we can move on with the presentations and I'll be available in the back. Either way. Move on. <laughs> All right. I have a question. Test, test. Oh, we have a question. Quick, quick question. Yeah, we got a question. <laughs> um, for the the grants that Cal Fire, for the grants, for the grants that Cal Fire awards, um, and they involve private properties. Do you come out and inspect and cite 
homeowners that are part of that grant at all or is the grant its own project and your business doesn't involve persons who receive cal fire grants are responsible for reporting back on how that grant funds were used um, and sometimes depending on the grant there is an evaluation process that goes with that um, but there isn't very if any single individual private property grants that have been given they're usually through firewise communities and clusters of people or nonprofit organizations or larger areas does that make sense so if you have questions about grants i can kind of help answer those or put you in contact with those that can't <laughs> Hi. Hi. We do inspections in our neighborhood, but we don't do the vacant lots. I was wondering, um, on the vacant lots, I don't see anyone being like held accountable when they have that going on. It's, I know that I'm right, not like other falling things to find people, and then I believe in, uh, I don't know if you did that. Three separate things. From the crime, and they hired someone to clean that lot. Okay, so three separate things. Public Resource Code 4291 does not apply to vacant lots that are not improved. So CAL FIRE does not have jurisdiction there. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, eight individual HOAs have um, CCNRs that address private lots, or they don't. And if they don't, they don't have enforcement. Third, Ebbets Pass Fire District has their own vacant lots ordinance, and Joan Lark assists with that. So that wouldn't be Cal Fire's jurisdiction. Do you want to speak to that a little bit, Chief? Well, I was hoping you'd just handle it for me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I did, but... <laughs> uh, yeah, Joe's jo in the back in uh, wearing a uniform, like the one I'm wearing, and she'll be happy to answer those questions for you. And there is a special uh, piece of the uh, local fire ordinance that helps you. Any other questions? We'll have our Cal Fire partners around to answer things uh, directly on sidewalks so uh there's no other questions for them in this setting we're going to go ahead and uh, move forward with yeah, our i understand idea. your information you're going to share with us give us a little inspiration on some things that we can do so uh i'm going to work hard on getting the technology to work so i'm going to bring that up as we do that would you mind just introducing yourself again? sure okay yeah. Hi, uh, wow, this weather, uh, Mother Nature, just like a woman, she can't make up her mind, huh? <laughs> um, so anyways, I'm Jamie Saul. I grew up in this community and watched how many things have changed. We are here today because of our concern of fire safety. When I was a kid, the old Colch fire <coughs> happened and we evacuated. It delayed the start of our school year, which was a good thing at that time. <laughs> Um, at that time, the Old Gulch Fire was a big fire, but as the years have gone by, we all have seen the size of fires grow bigger. Um, as of right now, I am working on a grant for my community, fingers crossed. Um, this could help make evacuate, evacuation routes uh, wider and maybe help our air tag with uh, suppression in the case that we did have a fire. I also know that fuel rejection efforts have been made on the Falcon Mine subdivision, which is right next to us. Uh, so many hopes with getting this grant will tie the two communities together. This will keep the 72 parcels in our neighborhood safer. With or without this grant, it is my intent to reduce the fuel in my community. We have several elderly menus or members in our community, many of which who rely on others. It is up to us as community members to seek out all options to keep our community safe. While we appreciate our firefighters, the burden of keeping everyone homes safe should not fall on their backs. Uh, grant I am working on is off of Darby Lane. Um, it's called the Darby Line Fuel Break, right off of French Gulch Road in Murphy's. This, oh, I'll get there. <laughs> this will reduce fuel on each side of the road, which is in hope would give a smaller buffer 
and a little more time for our <laughs> residents and fire personnel. Is it? Yeah. I don't it might not be on. No, no, no. I don't think it's on. Can you hear me? No. Yeah. No? Yes. Okay. This grant is a hand cut reduction of fuel to which uh, to widen roadways created more advantages for fire control points to stop fire due to fire intensity. The prescription of this grant is for hand thinning of everything under 10 inches in diameter at chest height with proper spacing approximately 35 feet from the larger diameter of vegetation. Vegetation only to be cut to the road right of way perimeter approximately 20 feet from the center line. Vegetation that has been cut will be chipped and broadcast back to the ground to innovate vegetation growth and to assist in erosion control. Total cost per acreage is 2,500 for 60 acres. Estimated grant cost is 150,000, which of this, in scope of things, 150,000 is a small investment. When you consider the potential millions in property loss that could happen if we don't take these measurements. Out of 72 parcels, we only had one that did not want to participate. If we want to get this grant, we have to, uh, oh, if we get this grant, we have to, we have formed a committee within our community to maintain the work that gets done, whether it be spraying, hand cutting, or goats to ensure everyone's hard work is not to go by the wayside. Sometimes our neighbors need education to see the bigger picture. They may love every tree and may even have names for them. I have found that people like this are more apt to be reluctant to brushing, burning, or even fire grants. <laughs> I'd like to share with you a woman in our neighborhood that I refer to as Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. She sees the beauty in all weeds, brush, ugly, and a danger. She collects rocks that look and resemble like hearts. She has them on her pathways and has created throughout her property. Um, her pro and each one represents a special person in her life. Yes, I am happy to say I have my own rock. <laughs> she doesn't burn, thin brush, or disturb her manzanita. When pg &E came in and s with their subcontractors, she wouldn't allow them to cut down any trees, um, but to only top them. But with lengthy conversation, she has come to realize applying for this grant is a good thing for her safety, her neighbors, and her community. None of us want to lose our homes or neighbors to something we didn't put any prevention into. <clears throat> I didn't know I was this winded. <laughs> uh, two summers ago, my husband and I, after a long day of work, decided to relax in our pool with our floaties. Yes, we were naked. <laughs> <laughs> I almost, <laughs> um, almost asleep floating, we heard air attack in helicopters. We both raised up to notice a helicopter right above us. <laughs> he was so close, I swear I could see the whites of his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you could imagine what he could see of me. <laughs> a fire had broke out just above us. Um, was he over the pool to dip out? Um, he must have been scared of the sight he saw, so he left. <laughs> the fire was from a neighbor, neighbor using a push weed eater and hit a rock. Oh. It doesn't take much to start a fire. We all know this. Um, while this could have wiped out our community, the impressive response from our fire personnel 
it was over as quickly as it started. This year, I have also formed a team that to remove logs throughout our community. Since the middle of March, we have removed over 100 logs and still have just as many to go. Um, these logs are prior to 2022, and the logs were supposed to be picked up by PG&E's. <laughs> Can't wait to talk to you, Daryl. <laughs> Dylan, is it Dylan? Dylan. 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 PG&E subcontractors Mario Tree Service. We have properties with damaged fencing and fire prone messes that the tree company added to our already chaotic neighborhood. We have decided after years of mess, it was time for us to clean it up and care for it ourselves. We also have been utilizing the Cal Fire Chipping Program for our neighbors in need to clean up down brush on their properties. It's a wonderful program. Um, my next adventure in our community will consist of uh, widening a few main roads for emergency vehicles and opening up a road that has been grown over for more than 20 years for fire access. Lastly, I'd like to work on a grant for a fuel break along the top of San Domingo Canyon between our community and Dogtown Road. It's an honor to have this opportunity to work with you all um, and be with great minds for the same good. So this, uh, this is the start of our community, which you see is pretty open. Um, Still open. So this would be Darby Lane, so right off of French Gulch and Murphy's. <coughs> this is our map. So when you this is when you first come in the red, where we're pretty open, then you get into the blue, which is pure mess. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. Horrible. Yeah. Oh, wow. So this actually is what I consider a really great photo. Um, it, it's not as messy as a majority of the parcels. Go ahead. Still not, not that bad. This is still a little closer mm -hmm. than this. I got hundreds of photos and to put them up here, they all look the same. So it didn't, I mean, this is basically what the whole subdivision looks like. Go ahead. This is off of my uh, back deck, and that shows um, San Domingo Canyon on both sides. And that's basically what an aerial view of how crazy it is out there. Go ahead. <clears throat> this is a, a road that needs major attention. Mm. Mm. This is our awesome log collection <laughs> part of it <laughs> uh, and and that's just about it i mean i look forward to talking to others and and getting more resources thank you thank you, thank you. very nice love your perspective and uh, every all the work you guys are doing um being active is the way to get things done uh, our next presenter is mary bobwood mary come on up I'm going to pass this over to you while I try to or attempt to bring up your uh, presentation. Please do. Okay. <laughs> um, by way of introduction, I'm Mary Boblett. My husband is Darwin Boblett. He works at Big Trees Market. You might know him. Um, and he's working today. Um, we moved into Lilac Park, which is the uh, focus of my discussion uh, this morning. And uh, just by way of introduction, on the day we got our keys, there was a fire at the top of Alder in a snowstorm because a cedar branch fell on a line and Evans Pass fire truck was, uh, their truck was stuck at the top of Alder because it's very steep and we couldn't get out to go back to our other house in Hathaway Pines. And this was in a snowstorm and so right away we both looked at each other and went, oh my goodness. 
So one of the first things that we did was uh, reach out to our HOA to try to get a grant started. We didn't know anything, and that kind of went unheeded. But uh, what we realized that day is that uh, exactly what Martin introduced us to this morning is we are darn vulnerable. Mm -hmm. we, we are, as individual homeowners and as communities of people who care about, mm -hmm. we're, we're vulnerable. And it's it, the slides that Martin showed. Um, initially, I was really happy to be here. And then the dismay, the dismay at being so vulnerable really grabbed me when I was sitting there. And then I got happy again because all these other speakers were talking about the great things that are going on. But um, make no mistake, we're vulnerable. So that has led our community of homeowners here in Lilac Park to produce a fuel reduction grant application back in a year ago. And it was awarded in June of 2022. And uh, imagine our surprise that our community got this grant. We were just ecstatic. We just threw it out there not knowing. So what I was um, uh, kind of asked to do was to provide some tips on how homeowners can do this. The homeowners themselves got together and went online and wrote the application. So I'm going to provide you some tips right now. The first one is research. Research your forest conditions, which we all have learned about today. Uh, Emily provided some great information about tree competition. In Lilac Park, we didn't have the bark beetle infestation that all the other communities in Arnold seem to have in Dorrington and elsewhere. We have a cedar forest with oaks and firs, but we had the big storm in 2021, and we have tree competition like you wouldn't believe. So like the other communities got the grants for the bark beetles, it's now time for Lilac Park to get some grants as well. So we gathered up community sentiment. Everyone said, oh, it's looking pretty messy. This is what Jamie encountered. Community members don't like messes. So we uh, parlayed that into a grant. We also recognize that there are nearby public resources and assets. What is in Lilac Park? Did you know that the Verizon Tower is at top of Grizzly Peak? and Lilac Park goes up and, and meets up with Grizzly Peak. We love that Verizon Tower, <laughs> we all do. And there's also very important public safety communication technologies up there. So those public resources and assets have to be saved. The firefighters need to get up there. The County of Calaveras back in 1979 said, we want to fight fires at the top of Grizzly Peak and Grizzly Ridge. And so this grant is gonna make that possible. Next slide. So homeowners, you can make use of these grant application webinars and question and answer sessions. I submitted a grant for the lower part of Lilac Park this year. I sat on these sessions. There were people just like you sitting in this webinar and asking questions and Cal Fire was there for every step of the way. There's some wonderful, wonderful people who recognize that we locals know where this grant money needs to go. And so they provided these wonderful modernization uh, methods and tools. It's very exciting compared to previous years. Next. You have access to free tools to organize your grants, organize your meetings, gather up information, and communicate. There are resources online that are free. I use Google to a lot, so I, I'm, I'm not a spokesperson for Google, but I really like Google. And I'd be happy to chat with you afterwards and talk about the tools that we use. So none of this is costly. I haven't spent any money. Um, and I have also, uh, in my briefcase, two pieces of double-sided paper that represent the extent of the paperwork that have been that's been generated as a result of my um, grant application work and that's it everything else is online so if our community can do it any community can do it and we recognize that the entire area of arnold and avery hathaway pines and murphy's needs to uh, step up jamie did it our community did it you guys can do it too I'll take any questions if right you have here, any. Right here. 
Uh, yes, sir. How, may, how much was your grant for and how many lots will it address? Okay, our grant is now underway with uh, the beginning of reviewing about 60 uh, lots. I think it's 57 lots and no, it's 61 lot. It's right around there. And uh, we received a grant in the amount of $369,000. Wow. Which wow. will cover both the contractor and the forester. We live here in Lilac Park. We are doing an in-kind donation of our time and expertise to the tune of $69,000. We are also not allowed to uh, benefit from this grant because we live there. It's not, not an ethical practice to do that. So we live there, we're gonna manage the project. Yes, sir. How did you find which grant you went for? I mean, how did, I mean, because there, there are so many different grants, how did you know what to look for? Cal Fire has done a great job of making their website easy to read. So really, Cal Fire is where you went? Absolutely. Okay. All right, any other uh, questions? Or are you going to be around yes. and networking afterwards? Yes, so, lunch, I'm here. All right. We're going to move into our uh, final presenter. Not, not to say that you're ready for this thing to be over, but you're probably getting hungry, right? Um, so we're going to have Pat McGreevy come up from the Cal-Am team. And uh, there's a reason that we're ending with Pat McGreevy, and it's really because it gives us real great global oversight of some fantastic work that you probably don't realize has been going on. So I'm going to let him uh, take over while I bring up uh, the presentation. Welcome, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. So let me start with, uh, uh, can you hear me in the back? Raise your hand. Yes, good. Okay, good. So um, our group got started right after the Butte fire. So the Butte fire started in the McCauley Canyon in the north part of our, our uh, county and it burned 72, acre, uh, 70, uh, 2,000 acres and uh, I think 800 houses, something like that, a couple deaths. Um, about, it was February 2016, right after the Butte fire, that we went to the West Point um, Cal Fire Station, and we met with uh, um, the uh, commander, the chief there, Mike uh, Leichenheim. And Mike, uh, and we had Beeline with us, and we asked Mike, what can we do to prevent another Butte fire <clears throat> from occurring in Calaveras County? He put his finger on a map uh, right where he wanted to. Did you mind holding that just a little bit closer? Closer. 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 There yes. you go. Closer. All right. So he put his finger on a map and right where um, uh, he, he would like to have a, a, a fuel break. And we said, well, we'll try to go out and get some money to put this fuel break in. And, uh, but we're not only interested in your fuel break, we're interested in landscape um, uh, uh, fuels reduction projects, you know, hundreds of acres or thousands of acres of that kind of thing. So anyway, we applied for a grant and uh, first one we didn't get, and second one I think we did get and we were, and, and we started our program. So um, at the current, uh, and so we will operate in um, Calaveras County and we operate in uh, Amador County and where um, our group consists of uh, uh, foresters and myself a, GI, a GIS guy uh, mapping and, uh, and a couple other uh, volunteers who uh, run projects. On the Highway 4 corridor uh, this is uh, our team Jan Bray registered professional forester myself and Lori Plouts and Haley Dillashaw are right grants and managed projects. If you want to talk to us or um, and or to Kaylee and Lori, they're over in next right over here in this area here. <clears throat> next slide, please. So we we believe that we can stop catastrophic wildfire from destroying our communities. And we, and we believe that we can do this through the <coughs> three-legged stool. 
which is in front of you, and this is what we're talking about today. So the first leg is an effective wildfire response, and that's CAL FIRE, and it's your Ebbets Pass Fire Department, it's your Murphy's Fire Department, and these guys are good and they know their job. So we're, we're, we're in good shape up there. The second part of the, the second leg is, is, uh, is uh, fire adapted communities, home hardening, defensive space, ingress, egress. That's you guys, that's your responsibility. And so that leaves the, the third part, the resilient landscapes, which is the wooey around our communities. So it's that, that line between the wildlands and the urban, and the urban areas. And that area is can, it usually uh, managed by the United States Forest Service, BLM, large ranches, water districts. The Calam team, which is us, is uh, we go in and we partner with these, with these agencies in order to uh, construct a fuel breaks. Next slide, please. So what actually do we do? Well, the first thing we do is we try to locate uh, strategic locations where landscape scale shaded fuel breaks will protect our community assets. When we got, when we're uh, at the next step is we, we uh, make a set of maps. Uh, I spend my, we make maps and then we change maps and we change maps and you know, we get it right. And, and then in these, and then in these maps, we, we map out where we cannot work. Those are archeological sites and places where spotted owls might be and uh, issues like that. And we also map out where we can work. And when we, then the next step is, well, what are we actually gonna do in the areas where we can work? And that, 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 that's called prescriptions. So that's uh, the prescriptions would involve, are we gonna thin the trees and do commercial thinning? Are we going to remove the, uh, the, the biomass? Are we gonna prune the trees? Are we gonna masticate? Are we gonna burn? There's a whole bunch of tools that, that are in our toolbox. So we, uh, we, we write our prescriptions simultaneously. We're writing environmental documentation that protects the natural and cultural resources in the area. Then we finally get on to estimating the cost of the project and we go out for bids for contractors. Um, and we award contractors based on value. Finally, we, uh, when the project gets going, we conduct weekly inspections for quality control and we do all of the above is performed at no cost to the landowner. Next slide. We can't do this alone, obviously, so here are our collaborators. Cal Fire, Calaveras uh, County Water uh, Resource Conservation District, CCWD, Calaveras Foothills Fire Safety Council, Calaveras County Office of Emergency Services, Firewise Communities, pg and &E, Private landowners, ranchers, Sierra Pacific Industries, Stanislaus National Forest, Utica Water and Power. And these are all, really all the people, all the groups in your community that are working in the, in the WUI to protect um, you, uh, our, our community sense like. So what's the threat? Um, <laughs> We're fortunate that CAL FIRE maintains a database of all fires over 10 acres that have occurred since the year 1900 until today. So here are the four biggest fires that have occurred in Calaveras County. And there's two take home lessons for this, for our group here today. That here's the Highway 4 corridor, this black and white line going up there, that's Highway 4. And notice that uh, in here we have the uh, Old Gulch Fire, which we, um, which you just talked about a moment ago. And the Old Gulch Fire um, started over here in Cal um, Old Gulch Road, Calvary Reedus, I guess, somewhere in there. And it burned this way up towards Sheep Ranch, 
went down to Highway 4. It actually crossed Highway 4 into Forest Meadows and, and burned some acreage there, small acreage, and, and firebrands actually went into the a deep Stanislaus Canyon and caused and started a couple fires there which were put out by air, air resources. So, uh, and then the next uh, uh, um, point that, w that I want to make is this is the old Gulch fire. And that was in, uh, uh, sorry, that's the, uh, Darby. Darby. the Darby fire in 2001. And the Darby fire started way deep in the canyon and, um, and burnt uh, up the canyon and it burned right into uh, forest meadows. And you can see, this is the ridge, the rim of the, of the canyon right here. And it burnt right up to uh, McKay's, this uh, area, which is a little bit that way. And if, it, and if it weren't stopped right here, it would have gone, the next step would have been uh, Big Trees uh, Park. So the point here is that our communities are vulnerable. Just as Mary Bottle had said a moment ago, we're vulnerable. <clears throat> the next point I'd like to make is that we can't just focus on our communities. So what happens up on Highway 26 corridor, we gotta pay attention there too. Because the Butte fire started over here in uh, Amador County, burned a crime through the McCallany Canyon and burned all, all, all the way down to Freco City Road and Sheep Ranch in, in that area. So we, when we think about fire prevention and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, treatment of uh, our forest, we, we need to have a comprehensive program that covers our whole county and actually into our neighboring counties as well. Next slide, please. Okay. Oh, wow. Colors are completely different. So, Surprise. So, so these are uh, the number of fires uh, that we've had uh, starting in uh, 1950 and ending in, in uh, 2020 and in and um, they're in five-year cohorts. So the bottom line of this slide is, is that the background level of wildland fires is around 1,000 acres uh, per year in, in Calaveras County. And, it, and then we have these disasters here, which we start with the railroad flat fire, um, the uh, uh, Old Gold Fire, Darby Fire, and the big one, uh, the Butte Fire. So there's thousands, I guess, of ignitions that occur in Calaveras County every, every year. And, and you, uh, property owners, put these ignitions out. And one of the ones you don't get out, the, our fire services get out. And, but it's only occasionally that we fail, that the system fails. And in, in most instances, it's because the, um, our fire response, the first responders can't get to that growing fire fast enough. So remember, all fires start real small and they grow large. So if they start in our deep canyons, like the McCallany Canyon, over in uh, off the Highway 26 corridor, or Camp 9 on the North Fork Stanislaus, those the our, our first responders cannot get there. There's no roads, and or or the roads are overgrown with vegetation, and uh, or and, uh, anyway the fire is growing, growing up uh, from the canyon, and our our suppression forces are waiting on the rim. Sometimes they get overwhelmed and have to retreat, as in the Butte fire. Sometimes we can put it out at the rim. Next slide. Um, Cal Fire just showed us a number of pictures like this. So the, the, the picture is asking the question, what's our goal? So our goal is, is 
And this picture is, is shown in this picture, taken in 1926 over in Amador County. So note that there's hardly, there's grass on the, on the ground, hardly any ground fuel. There's hardly any ladder fuel to take a ground fire up into the canopy. The trees are all big, and, the pine, and, and pine trees have thick bark, which is fire resistant. And um, these pine trees self prune, so there's no branches touching the ground. And they're well spaced so that the fire can't jump from this canopy here over to that canopy there. So this is, this is our goal. Note that you can see a whole football field. The line of sight is 300 feet, maybe more. So this is the situation in uh, 1920s, let's say. So now let's look at a few of the projects that we're working on in your community. Next slide. This is um, the Murphy's to Forest Meadows uh, project. So this starts behind the Diggins in, uh, in Murphy's and goes up the ridge line all the way to Darby Knob. This is what it looks like. Um, this here is the Forest Meadows Waybridge uh, project. And, and this slide here is right in the middle of the Forest Meadow Waybridge community, right next to 600 houses. Wow. If you want to learn more about these, this project here is being, uh, well, this is managed by uh, Calaveras County RCD. Uh, uh, Gordon Long is not here today. This is Lori Plautz's project, and she's sitting over here next to the camera somewhere. Next slide. There she is, yeah. Next slide, please. Uh, this is Hunter Reservoir. Hunter Reservoir, this is Kaylee Dillashaw's project, who is over, over here. This project will be the most difficult project that we will do. We're fi just finishing the environmental studies right now. We're about to go out for, uh, for bids for contractors. So um, we took this picture from the uh, Utica Canal, which is right here, looking down into, I think it's uh, Mill Creek, and you can look at all the fire fuel. Look at, look at how crowded and choked up the area is in there. Um, so, it, so our contractors are going to be challenged to pull all this stuff out and grind it up. So, why, so it's not only a difficult project to implement, but if you go back over this way, the Highway 4 would be over here, and right in here is Hunter Reservoir. Next to Hunter Reservoir are CCWD and Utica uh, Water and Power uh, Authority uh, uh, facilities. What they do, CCWD takes and pumps the water from uh, this area here in Hunter Reservoir and the Utica Canal, and they pump it all the way up to Camp Conn. And they and and that's where you, you all get your 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 domestic water. You also get all your your fire hydrant water. Their CCWD maintains one thousand one hundred fire hydrants between Murphy's and and Camp Conn. So if this place burns down, where this whole fire uh, hydrant system is compromised. Going the other way, Utica lets its water go down to Murphy's and all the way to uh, Angel's Camp. <coughs> and there's another, I don't know, 600 or 1,000 fire hydrants going down that way. So this area here at uh, in Avery at Hunter Reservoir is absolutely critical to our, our future. Nick. On the right here is another uh, Davy Killershaw um, project at Darby Apple. That's behind the, the, the Apple store down there on, uh, in, in Avery. Next slide, please. It's a slow oh, yeah. Um, so this is uh, Lori Plotz's project. And uh, this is Jan Bray, our forester. 
And uh, remember the 1926 slide where you could see a football field or two? Here in the line of sight is probably five feet. There's 26 acres of this. Um, and um, I'm taking this picture from the, uh, the what do they call it, uh, Dowd's Landing Road. So if this catches on fire, we have an ingress egress problem. So you, you have Ebbets Pass fire trying to get in, and you have the residents of Dowd's trying to get out, and you have this burning. It's yeah. not going to happen. It's going to be a disaster. Over on the right, we have another road issue. And this road is up of, uh, in our McKay's project, which I'm the project manager on this one. And uh, this road is 5N63 near McKay's Point Road. And uh, you can see if this, all, if this was on fire, the captain's not going to allow his fire engine to go down that road. So roads are really important, as you pointed out. Next, next slide. So here's, I, I brought the picture back so you could, to remind you what, look what, what our goal is. This picture here is um, a before picture. This is taken um, right above our McKay's project inside uh, Big Trees Park. And it's again, it's on a fire road, and um, we've well, I've already talked about the fire road. So, so anyway, the issue is the question is, can we take this forest which surrounds our communities and convert it into this? That's our goal. Next slide. The answer is yes, yeah. or we can get it pretty close. So here's a uh, uh, we. Uh, initial entry on all those pictures that I just showed you we're going to go in with masticators and these are pictures of masticators so you talked about your logs you can't get rid of your logs if, if it were our grant we would grind the logs and um, so we would use a, a, a machine like this a masticator with a masticator head and over here um, this masticator head is right here on the end of the big articulating arm that's, uh, that's on a, um, uh, what do you call this machine? The excavator. excavator. Okay. <laughs> so in this case, we can see the before is in the background. That's what he's masticating. And the after is in the foreground. So you can see the... Uh, masticating shreds that are sitting on the ground there. Next slide, please. So this is a close-up of the masticating head, and um, this, this thing spins about 2,500 RPMs, and, and this uh, contractor has, see these? These are called knives, as compare this one with out here. Um, these are called grinders, and so the grinders grind up the manzanita, and the brush pretty well, and the knives uh, grind up a uh, biomass. So they'll take a sapling that's, that's 25 feet tall, they'll put their head on top of it, and 30 seconds later or less, it's ground all the way to the ground. <laughs> this is the shreds that are left by the masticator. Here is a, a six inch, maybe, a mechanical pencil, and right next to it is a uh, stump of a sapling that uh, that they ground flush fl flush with the ground. These shreds around here are say six inches, twelve inches, and some of them go up to three feet if they slip through the masticator. But this is our goal, and our goal is to lay uh, to you to put these shreds on the ground so that they serve as mulch, just like the mulch you buy from Home Depot. And the mulch acts to maintain moisture in the surface, and, and it uh, also serves to um, uh, control erosion, and, and also it, it serves to retard the regeneration of the brush that we just masticated. 
Next slide. Oh yeah, so there are trade-offs. Masticators do um, occasionally hit granite rocks and cause sparks, and they cause fires. So uh, all of our projects, uh, the contractor is uh, uh, required to have fire, uh, fire trailer and fire uh, suppression equipment right on site where the work is being done. And as you probably all know, we all close down operations during fire season, which usually are in June, July, we're, we're pretty much finished. And uh, we don't start up again to, until no, November and when they're uh, after the rains come. Um, next slide. So here's some examples of some completed projects in your area. So this is the Arnold Wastewater Treatment Plant. So you all know where the taco truck is. It's across the street. So when you drive down <coughs> drive down Highway 4, when you get to the taco truck, look out your right window, and you're going to see this. So this is what we started with. And, and the prescription in this um, project was to keep the larger trees, diameter, the diameter at breast height, I think, was 30, 32 inches. And so we went in and marked all the trees in yellow and a yellow stripe. Here's these two trees or these two trees here. So we took out all this uh, vegetation in here and we thinned the trees. Um, the, the, the larger trees went to standard mill to, to make lumber. And uh, the biomass is too expensive for us to haul down to a uh, processing uh, um, area to make a, a place to make electricity or or to use a small uh, uh, dimensional lumber so we masticated the, it, the haul, haul costs are too high so we masticated all, all of this stuff here and then we have this layer of mulch that's on the bottom next slide <coughs> Yeah, this slide is the Davies Ranch, which is right out, which is in Avery. And uh, you drive by part of the Davies Ranch when you go down Highway 4. But it goes all the way over to the rim of the Stanislaus uh, Canyon. And so this is right on the, on the rim of the Stanislaus uh, Canyon. The canyon, the river would be over here. So, and this, this is a before picture, and notice we have Manzanita, and then we have all these little sapling trees that are mixed in with the Manzanita. The, this whole business here has been growing since 2001. I think this picture, I don't know, maybe 2020. So this is 20 years, 20 years of growth after it burned after the, um, the Darby uh, fire. This is an after picture. So what we asked the contractors to do was to go in with their masticators and pick off all this manzanita and get rid of it. So notice over here, there's no manzanita. But we also asked the uh, uh, contractor to select the healthiest sapling that they could, that they could find and to, um, and to save those saplings and to make the saplings 25 to 35 feet apart and then to and then to prune up all the trees uh, so this is what the after looks like we're right on the edge of the uh, of the stanislaus canyon and this this area will uh, i'm sure cal fire and uh our, our firefighters are going to use this uh, as an anchor point uh, to prevent uh, the fire to stop the fire from coming out of the canyon Next slide. Ooh. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. How did they That's a really big screen. <laughs> so you've got to do some mind work here. The point of this slide is is that uh, this this area here is Lily Gap outside of West Point. And it was um Masticated by in in the year twenty uh, by Robert Smith from from Mountain Ranch, 
And um, and this is, so this picture here is taken, I think, 2023. So this is 13 years after it was masticated. So noted, it looks just like when Robert Smith left. And um, so he thinned out the trees and we have, and left that layer of mulch on the ground. So we got 13 years maintenance free out of out of the mastication project that was done here. Um, so, oh yeah, and the ad, and the additional really interesting point was we had the, the beetle epidemic was 2012 to 2015 or around there, and you remember all the dead trees. Oh yeah, like boo, like springs. Um, so in this in this particular area where Smith uh, masticated and thinned out the trees, there was no beetle activity. All the forest around the tree, uh, around this project, got hit hard by beetles. <laughs> so this is what we call a healthy, um, fire-resistant uh, and drought driven beetle resistant forest. This 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 is a healthy forest. Next. So let's come back to Highway 4 now. We've looked at all our methodology and this is what how we're applying the methodology along the Highway 4 corridor. So if you uh, so this is what we call the Highway 4 wildfire defense system and the metrics is that oh just look at the colors so if it's a red color the fuel break is is been installed and it's uh, def uh, defensible look at the green the green are the projects that are that we're doing right now and uh, and the purple are or areas that we're thinking about that we should be doing some work in. So just when you focus, don't focus on Tuolumne County. This is uh, the North Fork Stanislaus River uh, Canyon. And uh, oh yeah, each one of these dots is a structure. So Microsoft has, has plotted every structure in the United States. And so, um, each one of these dots represents a structure like your home. And um, so, what, um, what, when you look at the total area that we're going to treat at, at build out, it's 10,000 acres. And so one acre is a football field, so it's 10,000 football fields. So, uh, and it runs from Murphy's, all the way up to to Dorrington to Camp Connell. It surrounds 8,500 structures. Estimated completion 2026. We'll probably miss that date, but that's our goal. And um, uh, and so the next. So now all of these all of these individual fill breaks are all going to be changed color into red, meaning they're done, but they're not done. <clears throat> what it really means is they're entering the maintenance phase. And so um, that, and that's the biggest problem that we have. Now this, you know, this looks really good and you say, great job, but it's not going to look like this 10 years from now. So what's the, uh, the next slide is going to be maintenance, I think. Oh, this is private pro or property. Yeah, I made this slide a couple of weeks ago, and I was really surprised. So here's the owners of the, of the fuel break, fuel breaks that we've been putting in. And here's their acreages way over here. And to my surprise, the private property owners, out of the 10,000 acres that we've been working on, that the private property of uh, uh, that half of it is private property, and the other co a quarter of it is Forest Service, and another quarter of it is is SPI. 
private property is really hard to work on because you've got to go get a right of entries from every one of those property owners to get onto their property. Now, I was really amazed when you said you got, what, yeah. 69 out of 70 or something like that? That's really good. Pretty convincing. Yeah. We need, <laughs> we need you. <laughs> the other guy is Pete Bedalford in the ball yeah. cap over here. <laughs> he really shames him. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, so we get, I don't know, we send out our letters. Maybe, if we're lucky, 70% of the landowners would re respond. So we got to send out a second letter and a third letter. And eventually we get it up to 95% compliance. And those other 5% hate the government and they hate us. And so we <laughs> will never get them. Next slide. <laughs> maintenance. So we know, we're pretty sure that the maintenance interval is five to ten years to to, re, to re, retreat our our fill breaks. So that brush is going to every ten years or so we got to go back and do something about that brush. Currently, there is no maintenance plan for any of the work that we're doing. So that means there's ten thousand acres on the Highway Four corridor, and there's also going to be ten thousand acres on the Highway Twenty Six corridor. So in Calaveras County, we're going to have, at build out, we're going to have 20,000 acres that needs maintenance. So, um, and, and it needs maintenance in perpetuity. So if we don't do the maintenance, we just kick the can down the road and let our, let our uh, uh, the next generation deal with it. So we either deal with it now or they're going to have to deal with it later. So a maintenance program this is all me talking, you know, I'm just thinking out loud. So um, the maintenance program is going to, for uh, 10,000 acres, just just the uh, Highway 4 corridor, is going to cost about $5 million for 10 years. So break that out. We really could, we could treat, uh, it's 10,000 acres, we could treat 1,000 acres per, per year on a rolling basis. And that would be $500,000 a year that we would have to generate. That's doable, not by funding from the county, which is, which is uh, broke all the time. Uh, that we, but we should probably, we could probably get, generate that money uh, through grants from the state or uh, federal uh, agencies. And such a maintenance program it's going to need some kind of an environmental study that lasts 10 years. We cannot be redoing environmental studies every year. And we can't be writing grants every year like we do now. On the Highway 4 corridor, I think we're, we're now up to nine grants. So we need some kind of funding that's going to go out for 10 years. And, uh, and, and we need environmental documents that are gonna go out for 10 years as well. So I think we need a fire marshal with expertise in forest management and mapping, writing grants, contracting, and more. So I'm really glad to be <laughs> you. <laughs> I think you're never, 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 never. So now I'm promoting you to Forest Marshal, and that's just an additional duty. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, um, we have uh, our supervisor is getting on this, and I uh, that he, so Hubbard is your supervisor. I hope he recruits Garamendi, who is my supervisor, and we can actually get this going. Hold one. Okay. So I want to end with the three-legged stool again. So we have our fire departments who do great work. We have the, our communities, which are you guys, and you're going to go home and get on it this afternoon. Uh, <laughs> and then we have the resilient landscapes, the wooey around us, and the Forest Service and ranchers, water districts. Water districts are really stepping up. Um, 
the Utica Water District and CCW are, are, are really pitching in to help. So the bottom line is, if one leg of the, uh, one leg fails, the whole stool the whole stool collapses. And so, please do your part. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. At the very end of our our um, presentation, we're going to get to our raffle, but we got time probably to handle maybe a question or two if that's all right with you. All right, Tom, you had a question. Yeah. So Pat, I see that you you've got the map and you've got what you've got going, what's been done, what's in process, and you're going to get all that done. Is there still areas where you don't have any answers for? That, that is not in your plan, that still is going to be a vulnerability? Yes. If everything gets done. Well, I, I think you could look at our work as being, how about bare minimum? You know, I mean, we, in reality, we should do the whole damn forum, the whole Sierra Nevada, yeah. <laughs> but, that, but that's impossible. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, right now, uh, uh, if you look at your uh, map, We've gone all the way up to the canyon rim on the Stanislaus, and right now we're bumping up against against the park, Heather's Park. And so Heather uh, gave her five-year plan, but I think uh, that uh, how much acreage are you covering in, in the park? Fifty percent, Richard. Can you speak to that? 2,800 acres. 2,800 acres is what the park. So round that up to 3,000 acres, and uh, how many acres in the park? 6,500 or something like that. 6,500. 6,500. Six so that means that after the five-year plan, that we still have. You do the math. Three, the 3,000. I do math in my head. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of acres that still need to be done. So I think the park is probably our. Um, Area of most interest from a threat viewpoint. Yeah. Well, okay. Can I have comments side. on that? Wait a minute, one at a time. I'd like to comment on that. Sure. So, you know, this is only a five year plan. It's not that we're going to stop there. We're going to continue our efforts, but this is the funding that we have available for the next five years. And actually, it's not going to cover it all, so we're going to continue to apply for grants. But I just don't want the community to think that we're stopping there. We're going to continue our efforts and we're going to keep going back to manage our forest. Okay, we're going to take one last question right here and then uh, we're going to go to the raffle. I was involved in wildfire fuel reduction a while back. The previous slide we had taking down the cost of like 500000 a year for 20 acres. I'm just wondering two things. One thing is, is there a way to go ahead and compare the average annual cost of doing the wildfire maintenance versus uh, waiting until there's actually a wildfire or, or waiting or doing wildfire fuel reduction projects if there's another way of doing that. And the one other question I'm thinking of is, is when I was involved in this several years ago, it was very hard to get maintenance grants. It was possible to get welfare mastication grants and that, but it was very hard. Is that situation improved? No, you're, you're right in the past, five years ago or so. It was, I don't think they gave out mastication grants. I'm not sure. However, that doesn't matter anymore. So our McKay's project, which is starting right now, is pushing a thousand acres, and and we were and we were granted from the Sierra Nevada Conservancy 2.1 million dollars, and the Forest Service is throwing in another 600 thousand or something like that. So maintenance grants are in now. Thank you, Dad.